Good evening, everybody. I'm really glad that played. I was going to have to ask Dennis to do an interpretive dance if the video didn't come up, or sing Italian opera if the audio didn't come up. So it worked out well for everybody. Um, yes, yeah, thanks for having us, uh, Dennis. Um, in lots of ways, Dennis provides uh, office space for, for me here and has graciously allowed Emily to work out of this facility as well. And what we want to discuss with you tonight is um, arguably the most significant marine invasion um, in history. Uh, for the longest time, we'd consider the green alga tax, Calerpa taxifolia and its invasion in the Mediterranean as the most significant one, but I think this one will surpass it. And what we want to do is uh, set the scene Caribbean-wide to uh, describe what's happened uh, with this invasion and the biology of the organisms um, specifically, and then bring it closer to home and let you hear what's happening uh, in, in our own backyard with respect to the invasion within the lagoon itself. And then lastly, we'll finish up with um, opportunities for you to get involved. And hopefully uh, something you'll take to heart and it'll be something you want to be involved in. So where do lionfish come from? Uh, well, they're native to the Indo-Pacific. And they're members of the scorpionfish family. Uh, there are 16 species of lionfish. And some of the most famous members of uh, that family are the stonefishes, which are uh, well known for highly toxic venom. In their native habitats, they grow to about 18 inches, weigh up to three pounds, and live about 15 years. They live on tropical and subtropical reefs, but other structured habitats as well, so mangrove communities, seagrasses, anything with structure. And within the last couple of years, uh, we've really seen an explosion of lionfish populations along the Treasure Coast. So on offshore, it started somewhere around 2009, widespread reports. By the time we get to the summer of 2010, uh, invasion within the Jupiter Loxahatchee River, Lower Loxahatchee River area. And then by the summer of uh, this past summer, 2012, widespread reports of them all over the lagoon, not just, not just offshore, but inshore as well. And USGS uh, is the main repository for uh, tracking these sightings. Uh, and so we can look at a sort of a time series of, of uh, the movements. And uh, in the late 90s, you can see already a well-established population here off of southeast Florida. Quickly moved to, to the Carolinas, very quickly by 2000, already, already to Bermuda. And <clears throat> the real lesson here is that uh, it's, they simply moved along prevailing ocean currents. So we already knew a lot about how ocean currents moved uh, within the western Atlantic here. Uh, and they basically moved along those lines. So moving on to the, the late 2000s, you can see just an explosion. So if we look at a quick time series, uh, in 1985, there was a record of lionfish off of southeast Florida. There's anecdotal evidence that they may have occurred before 1985, but that's uh, the, main, the main record that we look to is 1985. And as far as we know, that was eradicated. However, population quickly spread to, uh, off of North Carolina. Off North Carolina, it's constantly bathed with warm Gulf Stream water. And so uh, we had a reproductive population off North Carolina very early in this process. Again, quickly moved to Bermuda by 2000, and then started working its way across the Bahama Bank. And again, mo moving on prevailing ocean currents, spread uh, through, through the Straits of Cuba, down into uh, South and Central America, and uh, finally got into uh, the loop current of the Gulf of Mexico, and it's where we are today. So now we have this constant pipeline 
of, of eggs and larvae that are coming from the, the, the Caribbean and working their way into southeast Florida. So uh, it, it stands to reason that it started in southeast Florida. We thought we had controlled it, uh, but now it's come, come, come back to roost, or in this case, spawn. So here we are in 2012. As you can see, just widespread coverage. Uh, again, this is from the USGS website. It's not, a com not complete. You know, not everyone uh, uses the website, so I will put a plug in for that, that uh, if you want to log sightings into that site, this is the ultimate repository, so we can track these sorts of things. So let's talk about the biology a little bit. Um, first of all, one key, key take-home message here is that uh, they're venomous and not poisonous. So uh, there's no poison in the flesh, in other words. So if you were to eat the flesh, it wouldn't be you know, a poison, per se. And the, uh, the mode of envenomation is these spines. Uh, 13 on the dorsal, 2 on the pelvic, 3 on the anal fin. And uh, here's the, uh, the main order of business here. And that is, <clears throat> it's a tissue, glandular tissue sheath that, that encap encapsulates the spine. So when the, the spine um, penetrates the flesh and moves the sheet, uh, you're envenomated. Um, and it's a uh, neurotoxin, causes a lot of pain. Um, those, that's the main symptom, pain, and then uh, from what I've personally witnessed, um, profanity. <laughs> um, I, and I, haven't, I haven't had the displeasure of being, being hit yet, but I figured I'm just on borrowed time. And if it's anything like a squirrel fish, it's, it's not going to be enjoyable because I haven't been hit by those. Um, <clears throat> but just know that it's not a hypodermic. It's not like a viper, so it's not venom going through the middle spine, but rather there are grooves on the side of the spine that are holding the venom. Uh, and it's just this glandular tissue that's, pro that's producing that venom. So the treatment, in case you are hit, is um, non-scalding heat for 30 to 90 minutes, and painkillers will let you fill in the blanks to your favorite painkiller there. But certainly the, you know, the uh, hot, hot water stream that's coming out of an outboard motor is a, is a good choice. These things often happen on boats. And within the Caribbean, it's two of the 16 species uh, that, that occur here. And here's where they occur uh, in their native habitats in the Indo-Pacific. So it's uh, the double filefish and the red. And uh, genetic studies have shown that the red lionfish makes up about 93% of the Caribbean population, whereas uh, only 7% of the Caribbean population is made up of the devil firefish. And they, they are slightly different in their meristics. In other words, uh, the dorsal and anal rays, so you can tell them apart that way. And genetic studies also show that uh, there are nine female mitochondrial haplotypes. And those are just big words that say that females pass on mitochondria. Remember the powerhouses of the cell, if you remember reaching way back in the memory banks? Um, <clears throat> it's the females that pass those on to the progeny. Uh, and so we can get an idea of how many females have contributed to this Caribbean population. And right now, the answer is only nine. Don't know how many males that would be, though. So in terms of their prey items, this is some of the perhaps most disturbing news about um, the ecological ramifications of this invasion, and that is Caribbean-wide, over 50 prey species of fishes and vertebrates have been identified. In one Bahamas study, uh, they were able to reduce patch reef recruits up to 80 percent. Uh, another Bahamas study, uh, the, the main prey items were gobies, flame fishes, wrasses, basslets, and shrimps. Small decapods, especially shrimps, uh, seem to play a really big role. Uh, in general, they seem to eat mostly um, crustaceans uh, as juveniles and switch to mostly fishes, but that's just a generality. Uh, in a North Carolina study, they're probably eating small ceranids, grunts, parrotfish, parrotfish, et cetera. And a little bit of data from Martin County, hopefully you have more of that this summer. Uh, peppermint, shrimp, gobies, and blennies were, were found in the guts. So somewhat good news in that most of the gut content work uh, does not show that they're primarily eating what we consider uh, recreational or commercially important fishes. Um, however, they're definitely competing with those um, fishery species. And so it, it might be a matter of, of competition more so than direct predation in which they're uh, affecting our native populations. In terms of reproduction, uh, this is uh, what's disturbing and why invasions happen so quickly. They're sexually mature at about one year. Females can spawn as frequently as every four days with clutch sizes up to 30,000 eggs. <clears throat> An unpalatable floating egg mass, unpalatable as in um, you know, to marine creatures. Uh, we suspect that in their, their native range in the Indo-Pacific, um, their population 
is, is mostly controlled probably at the egg or larval level. In other words, there are predators on their eggs or, and or larvae. Not, not happening to our knowledge here in the Caribbean. Uh, courtship has been observed, but no spawning observed, but clearly they're spawning, <laughs> doing quite well at it. <clears throat> so here's a projection of uh, the uh, Atlantic population. And this is mostly based on uh, the temperature tolerances. So the 10 degree Celsius isotherm is somewhere around Rhode Island, um, here on the eastern seaboard. And, and that's the point of juvenile death. And then 16 degree centigrade isotherm, somewhere around Banks, North Carolina, uh, is where feeding stops. So these are you know, examples of mesocosm studies showing these things. So, so when we look at potential for the spread of, of um, these invaders, it's mostly based on temperature. And, and there are unfortunately a few other considerations. For example, <clears throat> um, they've been found in five PSU, that's practical salinity units uh, in the Loxahatchee. So full strength seawater is about 35 PSU. Um, so they're clearly capable of osmoregulating, getting into almost fresh water. So that's one of our big concerns about the moving in the estuaries. And this is a picture of one that was taken from a submarine at 1,000 feet. So, so clearly tolerances you know, are, are one of the key issues here and there's little to slow them down in regard to their life history requirements. And one study from, from Florida to North Carolina, depths from 50 to 100 meters, it was the second most abundant fish seen, second to scamp. So it's the deep water habitats that, uh, that might be where the invasion really started and really took hold. Uh, those areas where you know, we don't spend a lot of time diving and it didn't realize it was happening. So other key issues here, uh, within the Caribbean, their max size is 22 in inches, unlike their native range. They grow about half a millimeter a day, which is pretty fast. Caribbean densities uh, can be as much as 10 times that in the Indo-Pacific, so in other words, 40 per 100 meter squared of reef. Um, and our fish survey information uh, from places like Reef, um, RVC, that's a Reef Visual Census, so more on that in a moment. Our fisheries dependent and fisheries independent monitoring. These are all ways in which we can track fish populations, including this invasion. And so you'll see uh, a graphic there that shows you that in the, within the Florida Keys from 2009 to 2011, uh, based on these different types of surveys, um, frequency of occurrence started reaching somewhere around 30%. So about 30% of the sites um, surveyed had lionfish in them uh, by winter of 2011. Um, Cigatera is, is a potential issue. Any tropical or subtropical reef associate is going to have the potential for Cigatera poisoning. So FDA has put this species, uh, these species on their advisory list. Um, and that list includes snappers and groupers and hogfish and a lot of things that you see in, in the seafood industry. Uh, but certainly there is you know, some concern. So we're always eating at our own risk when it comes to um, <clears throat> eating reef species. Um, and early data showing us that mercury level is relatively low, and given their wide variety of, uh, of food items, that's probably not that surprising. Uh, so here's the, uh, the latest uh, up to December of 2011 in the Keys. So all the way out to Marquesas and Tortugas, they're pretty much everywhere. As I mentioned, the Reef Visual Census is one of the fish survey tools that we use. This was done in the... Uh, uh, for, for several decades, and we've just recently started doing it along southeast Florida. And, and basically, it's uh, just divers that work within uh, a 15-meter cylinder, so they're counting all the fishes within a cylinder, and these are timed. Uh, so perhaps not the best for locating lionfish, but one of many, many methods for, for looking at fishes, fish community structure in general. Fish don't always cooperate, as you can see here, so it has its uh, limitations. Uh, but as I mentioned, last summer was the first summer that uh, we started doing it in southeast Florida, and this is something we'll be doing every two years. So you can see these randomly placed stations along uh, our reefs here. This is off the Indian River region. So from Stewart to Miami, when I say southeast Florida is what I'm referring to. Uh, so we'll be doing that again this summer, and we've got some preliminary data from last year. So of 870 cylinders monitored last year, 8% of them had lionfish in them. So about known predators, um, as I mentioned, within their native range of the Indo-Pacific, uh, we'd like to think they're being controlled at the egg or larval level. 
Um, within the Caribbean, though, we're very interested to see uh, if we can get help from the native species for reducing these populations of lionfish. So we do have examples of uh, groupers, mutton snapper, and sharks uh, taking them. Uh, mostly that's been diver assisted. In other words, a speared fish offered to one of the natives and, uh, and they'll, they'll take it. In one study in, in Exuma, uh, they looked at a marine protected area that had um, really high density of groupers because it's a no-take no area. And lionfish uh, population was really low compared to the fished areas. So it's just, it's just a reminder to us that we need to have our full community structure of fishes and, and other organisms uh, in order for the, uh, the system to accept something like an invasion. I'm still hoping that <clears throat> Goliath grouper will play a big role. Goliath groupers are very important on reefs, of course. They eat a lot of the spiny things like porcupine fishes and, and of course, spiny lobster, et cetera. So I'm really hoping that they'll develop this search image. I've personally uh, fed speared ones to uh, green moray and one of our native scorpion fishes here. And uh, also to uh, some great triggers, which was welcome since the, they'd stopped, stopped biting me. They usually bite me during the fish survey, so it's nice to have them some, something else for them to eat. And um, some porgies came in as cleanup. We got a picture from the Keys of a cormorant, a diving bird, taking one. Uh, but of course, the best predator of all, of course, is, is us. Um, <clears throat> so because they're not readily taken on hook and line, um, it's going to be up to us to use these kind of, of, of um, spearing and, and, and perhaps fish trapping. You know, there's still some, some work to be done on that. The invasion reminds me of um, this green alga, Calerpa brachypus, that moved into this region about 10 or so years ago. And one of the uh, native species, a um, sea urchin, started consuming it. So hopefully it's just a matter of some of our native species gaining the search image uh, to start consuming these. And um, we as divers can assist that by offering speared fishes. <clears throat> and it's this invasion of the back reef habitats that we really want to center on tonight. By back reef habitats, I mean those habitats that are uh, related to the reefs. For example, 80% of the species that we find on offshore reefs here spend some portion of their life history within the Indian River Lagoon. Habitats like oyster reefs, mangroves, and seagrasses. And so we're very interested to see what the invasion is like uh, in those habitats. Um, Man-made structures, of course, uh, play a role in that as well. Um, and we're very curious to know, <clears throat> are they settling within these back reef habitats um, as larvae growing to maybe a juvenile or adult stage and then moving offshore? That happened in the Turks and Caicos. It doesn't seem to be happening in, in most other places, and I suspect that that's not how it's, it's happening here. But that's just one of many research questions that we have. Last summer, uh, as I mentioned, the explosion of reports happened within the lagoon. Um, we decided to, to do a survey transect. We called it the uh, Lionfish Mega Transect. And so uh, just people from the natural resource community and other interested parties helped us by doing surveys uh, within the lagoon. And here's just the data sheet that we provided for it. So let's take a quick tour of the lagoon. I'm going to start at the north end of the lagoon, uh, Ponce de Leon Inlet in uh, Volusia County, just south of Daytona. And just keep in mind as we go through this that uh, any yellow dot with a red center was previously in the USGS record, so it would have been recorded 2008 to 2011. Um, a yellow dot is a new record as of last year, and then a green dot would be from winter of this year. So you can see just a couple of examples of Ponce Inlet. One of them just south of Ponce Inlet, in fact, 11 kilometers south of the inlet. Moving into Cape Canaveral, we had one previous record, and we saw uh, 14 more last October. The port, by the way, has taken it upon themselves to start an eradication program within the port. Uh, moving down into the uh, Melbourne area, you've got uh, one record 10 kilometers north of Sebastian Inlet at Honest John's Fish Camp. Sebastian Inlet, quite a few seen. In fact, 50 were taken from the dock at Sebastian Inlet State Park uh, last summer by uh, an aquarium trade company. And there's that dock. As you move south, you're probably starting to see a trend. You, you start picking up more, more examples. So uh, around Fort Pierce Inlet, 
um, quite a few seen uh, in mangroves and man-made structure. And some south of the inlet as well. By the time we get to St. Lucie Inlet, again, you know, we've increased in number. Um, a lot in the mangroves, you can see on the, the south end there. This is all mangroves in here. And one very interesting record, almost up to Roosevelt Bridge on a oyster restoration site, 12 kilometers upstream from St. Lucie Inlet. When I give you the distances, it's as the fish swims, by the way, not as the bird flies. And moving into uh, the Jupiter Narrows, a couple of records there. This is on Peck Lake, six and a half kilometers south of St. Lucie Inlet. And then um, for those keeping score at home, the most uh, distant is the 707 Bridge in Hope Sound. Three specimens there. So this is roughly equidistant between St. Lucie and Jupiter Inlet. So you're talking about a 14 kilometer swim for these fishes. And once we get to Jupiter Inlet, that's where things really start to explode. Over 300 have been documented by Florida International University uh, on those stretches that are shown with the, the yellow bands. And the one that I mentioned that was found in um, five PSU, Salinity, is here on a restored oyster reef, or uh, six and a half kilometers upstream of Jupiter Inlet. So obviously some real concern. It, it speaks to ocean current patterns. It speaks, it speaks to um, the ability of these fishes to ride the Gulf Stream. Um, Jupiter Inlet, very close to the Gulf Stream. So, you know, clearly eggs and larvae are being transported by the Gulf Stream and dropped off into places like this. So that explains some of the patterns that we're seeing. But uh, the, other, the other part of this is most people don't snorkel in the lagoon. Um, you know, it's very brackish, tannic, tannic water. Um, but that leads us to the next part of the talk, and that is uh, Emily Dart from Antioch University who's working on this issue. And she started with Smithsonian last summer as an intern and really gravitated toward the project uh, and this, uh, this invasion. And so videos tonight, so <laughs> got some good ones. It's almost done. Um, this is actually a video of a lionfish that I found last summer in the mangroves of the St. Lucie Inlet, um, and it's a unique video because it also captures a species that we're specifically worried about that they might be competing with, the gray snapper, and you can see it swimming around the lionfish. And he also was not scared of me at all and actually came out towards me to check out my camera. There he is. All right. Um, thank you, Jeff, for starting out the presentation tonight. Um, and those of you who have heard me before, I am changing up my presentation just a little bit, so don't mind the notes. Um, as Jeff showed, this is a rapidly spreading invasion um, on a large scale and also locally um, and a regional scales. So clearly this brings us to the question, uh, what exactly is happening in the Indian River Lagoon? Because um, com combining the sightings that you saw and a study that was done in the Loxahatchee, the last slide, um, showed that clearly there are high numbers of lionfish um, in specific areas of the Indian River Lagoon and probably a lot more than the, the sightings that we've seen. Um, but in general, we are lacking uh, information on this population. Um, we are getting a lot of anecdotal information, so research is, is definitely needed. Um, so this brings us to my current research and also uh, other questions that I do have um, and that a lot of us have about lionfish in the lagoon. Um, so tonight I'm going to talk about lionfish, but I'm not just going to talk about lionfish. Um, I'm going to, the bulk of my talk is going to be more the conceptual framework um, of scientific or research inquiry that I'm interested in. Um, so my lionfish research, uh, lionfish research in general, is not really in isolation, um, but rather nested in concepts or inquiry pertaining to marine biology, um, ecology, um, estuarine science, my specific interest, estuaries and their habitats, their food webs, uh, their communities, um, their um, 
also they're humans and the human activity. Um, so I really think that having a grasp and understanding the conceptual framework um, helps us to better understand or better to frame my lionfish research and lionfish research in general. Um, so my personal interests overall, if I could narrow them down, um, as uh, Dennis and Jeff mentioned, are uh, tropical, subtropical, coastal habitats. I'm really big into habitats, ecosystem-based management um, and habitats, communities, and things like that. So, and I'm also specifically interested in mangroves, as you've heard, um, and the connectivity between these these habitats, mangroves, seagrass, coral reefs, and even deeper reefs, um, and connectivity in terms of how fish use these habitats um, throughout their life. Um, so as many of you may know, mangroves are very valuable habitat, and we had a lot of them in the Indian River Lagoon. Um, they provide many ecosystem services, um, meaning they provide us with very valuable things, such as erosion control, um, absorption of uh, land-based toxins, uh, pollutants. Um, they also protect us from storm surges, uh, hurricanes, tsunamis, things like that. Um, and they also provide valuable habitat for terrestrial and marine organisms. Um, and that's what I'm interested in. Um, they're also known for providing uh, vital nursery habitat for fish. And that is also a big or a key factor here in the Indian River Lagoon when we think about these habitats in the IRL. Um, so why do we care? What's the big deal? What, what's the deal with these habitats? And why do we care about the Indian River Lagoon? Well, we all know that it's one of the most biodiverse estuaries in the country. Um, and that it houses you know, endangered species um, and many species in general. Um, it contributes to the nation's and the state's fisheries economy. Um, and it's huge. <laughs> and it also um, is very unique in that it covers the uh, temperate and tropical ecotone. So it's a very unique estuary. Um, it also, there's a lot of controversy and critical environmental issues and challenges surrounding the Indian River Lagoon. So everyone has their specific interests and why they love the Indian River Lagoon. Um, but I think what's key to remember is that all the different components, the habitats, the organisms, the humans, everything, is a part of the functioning of the entire lagoon, or the overall functioning of the lagoon. Um, and the conservation of the habitats um, is critical for the health and survival of not only the organisms, but the productivity, um, the health and biodiversity of the lagoon itself. Um, so kind of changing gears here to emphasize the conservation of habitats um, from a management standpoint. The South Atlantic Fisheries Management Council, um, which manages fisheries, eight fisheries um, from coast to 200 miles offshore from North Carolina down to the Keys, um, in efforts to sustain, sustainably manage these fisheries, um, they have a major emphasis on habitat conservation. Um, and in their management plans, which are very lengthy, they really use an ecosystem-based approach. And they've developed essential fish habitat areas and um, habitats of particular concern for many different reasons, whether it be um, anthropogenic influences or invasive species, things like that. So what's important about this is that a lot of these areas, a lot of these essential fish habitats and areas of concern are in the Indian River Lagoon. Um, and uh, just a note, out of the eight fisheries, there's only one that's overfished, and that's the snapper grouper complex, a group of um, several fish species that are managed. Um, and a lot of the fish that we think of, of course, like I mentioned before, snapper and grouper, um, that a lot of us like to fish. So this is just a map showing a project I did last semester in school, which was an overlay analysis of um, the different habitat layers, so where more of them overlap is kind of like what you would call priority areas, um, and that's in the dark green. So I was just kind of showing that, yes, these areas, these waters are very important. They're essential fish habitat, even, you know, even to, the, to the government and big agencies, and the lionfish are in these habitats. As Jeff mentioned, uh, that led me to last summer, because I initially wasn't um, coming here to necessarily research lionfish, but to research mangroves. So last summer, indeed, I did find lionfish in the mangroves in the St. Lucie Inlet area, close to the inlet, and then the Fort Pierce Inlet as well. And just uh, 14 individuals that is able to dissect, um, not that many, but we found, similar to other studies, that they were consuming fish at older ages and uh, a lot of shrimp, the younger fish, all shrimp. And that brings us to concerns about the Indian River Lagoon, specifically edible shrimp, uh, blue crab, snook, um, and specifically if lionfish are eating, not just say, oh, you know, are they directly predating on snook when they're juveniles, but eating the fish that snook eat. So are they competing with these, these uh, fish that we're worried about, um, specifically mosquito fish? Um, so 
diet is definitely something that we need to look at for lionfish in the lagoon. Um, getting a little, I'm trying to bore you here with this one, but this one gets, gets me excited. Um, so the estuary science part and how do lionfish fit in? Well, uh, a study by Martino and Abel in 2007 show they were examining different fish communities and estuaries and saying really overall uh, abiotic factors like salinity and temperature affect different fish communities and fish species on a large scale. But really on a small scale, uh, biologic factors such as predation and competition and interactions between species kind of determines communities on a smaller scale, um, whether it be specific habitat or uh, microhabitat. And since we're learning that lionfish clearly don't have a lot of abiotic tolerance limits, they're up in areas where certain fish are that are near the inlets, they're up in low salinities, they're everywhere. So what I'm interested in is the fine scale. What is, how are they affecting these smaller communities through species interactions, um, predation, competition. Um, also, other studies done by Baker and Sheaves, um, 2005, talk about the importance and the lack of attention towards how predators affect these communities. Because we always talk about mangroves and how they serve as nursery and how they serve as habitat. Um, but we don't talk about how the predators affect this. Because there are predators. I mean, there's barracuda, there's snook, there's all these fish in those nursery habitats. And so how do they affect that? So they got me thinking, well, then how are lionfish going to affect that? Because I'm finding them in these areas with our native fish. So in terms of researching specific species, which is also another uh, recommendation for mangrove research, is, is how do specific fish species use this habitat? So looking at their specific use, their habitat use um, has direct implications for the resources that they're consuming and the other species that they're interacting with. So these three elements are very closely intertwined. Um, and when you start researching one, it can start shedding light on the other. Uh, so what do we want to know? What, what do we specifically want to know about lionfish in the Indian Lagoon? Well, we want to know about the population itself. Um, how big is it? Um, what is its range? Where are the hot spots uh, of, of concentrations of lionfish? Um, and then as Jeff talked about, how are they using the estuary? Are they settling in as larvae and moving offshore when they turn into adults? Um, because there's different categories of how fish use estuaries. Or are they going to be estuary dependent and stay in the estuary for their whole life? Um, learning this is, is great and all, but that's also going to have implications on their resource use. So if they're spending their entire lives in the estuary, that means they're going to be consuming a lot of fish, a lot of other crustaceans for their whole lives, which Jeff said, you know, up to 15 years. So we really want to get just the basic information on this population. Um, our next question, we all want to know. So then what are the ecological implications for this? What will the effects be on our native communities and native species? Um, and then ultimately, of course, how can we <clears throat> affect this? How can we mitigate their influences? Highly unlikely, we're not going to be, be able to eradicate them. Um, but how can we understand them more and know them more, understand this population so we can at least mitigate their, like I said, their uh, influences? on our native communities. Um, so this brings me to my research. Um, so where do I begin? It's been really hard to, to not ask like 85 questions. I was told that I'm only supposed to ask one or two and try to answer that in a master's thesis. But So I'm really trying to cram a lot into one project. Um, so as I mentioned, the habitat use and resource exploitation and species interactions are all intertwined. So that kind of works for me. So I'm going to start with how are they using the mangrove habitat? What is the nature of their use? Are they just swimming in and then leaving? Or are they settling in at this habitat and staying? Um, so that is site fidelity. Um, it was exhibited down in the Loxahatchee River that they had high site fidelity. They, just, they don't really move. And that's been shown also on reefs. Um, so I want to know if they're doing the same thing in the mangroves. Um, so I'm doing a small tagging study in the Fort Pierce mangrove area. And I'll tell, it's still preliminary, but I'll tell you right now I have fish that just don't move. It's been a month and a half, and they're the exact same spot. So that's good news. They're exhibiting the same behavior. So that's good for removal efforts. <clears throat> but it's also not great, because that says that there's enough resources in those areas for them to sustain just, you know, just staying there. Um, specifically, I have a juvenile that hasn't moved an inch. So that juvenile is, is able to get enough uh, food to grow and be healthy and stay there. Um, he's definitely growing. So that'll be a short study, and, and don't worry, I will. Uh, remove all my tagged individuals after the study is done. Um, I also, in terms of habitat <coughs> that we're finding them in, what, are there any trends or patterns in habitat characteristics in the mangroves that we're finding them? That'll be able to um, 
we'll be able to maybe pinpoint hotspots or be able to say that you know they're gonna they, they, they usually pick this habitat, so we're gonna go there and remove them. Um, there's a lot of mangroves we can't search them all, so how can we maybe pinpoint areas? Um, also, be measuring everybody. Um, are we finding just young fish in the estuary? Um, so measuring everybody, looking at diet, of course, and then comparing to other habitats, not only in the estuary but offshore. We want to put it in a big, bigger context. Um, and we also want to know what they're eating on our offshore reefs as well. So might as well do a comparison study. Um, and I, I didn't say there. Also, reproductive capacity. Be interesting to know if we have gravid females um, spawning individuals in the estuary. Uh, we also don't know that, if they're leaving to go spawn or if they're coming back. So I'll pass it over to Jeff to finish the rest of the presentation. All right, thanks. She did a good job, didn't she? You should stick around and answer those other 84 questions for the, the rest of your career. You could end up like so many of us that came to the lagoon and didn't realize we'd stay for a whole career, but it was just such a great place to be, despite problems like this. So. We hope we've not left you with doom and gloom. That's one of my concerns, and I don't want you to walk out of here depressed. So I have a slide that says the good news, and I'll let you decide if there's any real good news in it. But uh, at this point, over 300 have been seen in Loxahatchee, roughly 100 elsewhere in, in the lagoon. And that has a lot to do with the fact that we really haven't been looking, and these are difficult places to look. So no doubt the numbers will increase. But the good, good news is we are relatively early in the estuarine invasion, so it's time to jump on this. As she mentioned, they show strong site fidelity. If someone gives us a GPS coordinate of where they've seen one, quite likely it will be there when we come back. For the Loxahatchee study, it was 80%, 80% in the same place. We've got a highly motivated natural resource community. I'm looking at some of them right now. And there's been you know, quite a bit of public interest in this, um, including from groups like Team Frapper, who's here tonight, and, um, and, and others, uh, nonprofits, et cetera. So, once we determine uh, the best way to start controlling um, within the estuary, uh, we know we've got some volunteers to help with that. Again, we're hoping that native predators will learn to get that search image to start, start taking them out for us. And there's lots of opportunities for applied research, so any students out there. And the other good side of this is they taste yummy. Um, I don't know what we'd do if they, they didn't taste so good. Um, <clears throat> And so some of the applied research being done, you see a trap there at the bottom, it's a chevron trap. We, we've got quite a few that are showing up in lobster traps in the Keys to the point that those commercial fishermen are selling them to the seafood market. So there is the, the potential for developing lionfish specific traps or nearly so. So that's one of the areas of research that uh, need to be worked on. So if you're interested in doing these sorts of things and have never done it, there's some things you need to keep in mind. Key, key removal issues. One is there's really only one good set of gloves out there <laughs> if you're going to try to protect your hands from these things, and that's the hex armor gloves that you see there. Secondly, you're going to need a thick bag. Uh, if you spearfish before, um, you might use a stringer or a mesh bag. Not going to work. You're, you're probably going to be uh, envenomated. So you want a thick bag, and we find that uh, dry bags, um, which are used on boats, keep things dry, of course, really thick plastic. They're, they're terrific for, for keeping lionfish stored. You've got various tools on the market that are even lionfish specific. As I mentioned, Team Frappers here tonight. I'm sure they'd be glad to talk to you about their ingenious device. Uh, nets as well, another great collecting uh, tool. We mostly use nets in the mangroves, by the way, because we're trying to, to uh, capture, tag, and release and recapture. But really, we've just learned that working in tight spaces, the nets work the best. Our agency issued a harvest order about them, so there's some, some key components that I'd like you to take home with you tonight. This was given uh, last August. It goes till this August. We're quite likely going to be incorporating this into our rules. More on that this summer. Firstly, there's no recreational fish license required if you're taking lionfish with pole spear, Hawaiian sling, a lionfish-specific device, or a handheld net. Secondly, harvest with hook and line or as bycatch and other legal gear. Uh, for commercial rec recreational fishing, that's okay. Hook and line is a rarity, but as I mentioned, our, our lobster fishermen in the Keys are getting them in their traps. There's no limit. Take all you like. Uh, this does not, however, allow spearing in prohibited areas. So those rules still apply. What are those areas? Within 100 yards of public fishing piers and bridges and whatnot. Within 100 feet of any jetty that's above the surface of the sea, except for the last 500 yards. 
And of course, within prohibited areas like state parks and prohibited gear still apply, so we're still not letting you use dynamite. <laughs> so now we come to the part <coughs> where you can consider how can I be part of the solution for this issue? Well, there are quite a few uh, roundup or you know, removal events happening here locally. Some of those folks are here tonight. We've got tables set up out there, so I would encourage you to go by and, and see them. Uh, the first one here is coming up uh, July 13th. This is Martin County's annual fishing tournament for their artificial reef program. It has a lionfish category. Last year, the largest specimen was 15 and a quarter inches. I have a feeling that will be beat this year. And it could be one of you that, that does that and wins the prize money. There's money involved, too. <clears throat> and there's their website. Secondly, the uh, Treasure Coast Lionfish Safari. This is uh, the first annual will be happening this summer, also in July. <laughs> Those folks are out there, sponsored by Team Frapper and, and some others. And lastly, uh, Reef uh, is a group out of the Keys that uh, does uh, derbies all over the state. They've got a couple lined up for Palm Beach and Fort Lauderdale this summer. How else can I help? Well, as I mentioned, the main repository for sightings is this USGS uh, database. And we've got cards out there on the tables, so you won't have to memorize this impossibly long uh, site name. So grab one of those and take it with you. Uh, that's, the, like I said, the main place to be logging where you've seen them. When it comes to ones in the estuary, however, Emily and I are especially interested in those. So we would also like to hear from you if you see them within the estuary. And if you're feeling motivated enough to try to remove them from the estuary, well, we'd like those samples. We would need them tagged, and we need them frozen. We need to know where you got them. Tagged and, and frozen, by the way, uh, frozen specifically uh, so that we can do gut contents. So if you take a fish and don't put it on ice immediately, you're going to lose the guts, and we're not going to know what it's been eating. So that's really critically important to us. And lastly, we ask that you not remove any lionfish from mangroves in Fort Pierce and St. Lucie's. That would really cramp Emily's style as she's trying to do work on that. But that's just for 2013. Um, you know, we'll have a whole new uh, set of ideas for 20, when 2014 rolls around as to, to where and how we want to see removals happening. And then lastly, what you can do is assist Emily with her thesis. She's here tonight. Anyone who's interested, she's always looking for volunteers or victims to, uh, to go out and help her. And uh, too many people to thank, but I think I hit most of them here, especially uh, Zach Judd from FIU and Brandon Smith from Brevard County and others that contributed toward this. And again, once again, thank you so much to Harbor Branch for allowing us to do what we do here uh, and also providing a venue for, for talking about it. So thanks for coming.